Nation. Providing you with the practical tools and expert knowledge to optimize your strength, health and mindset inside and out. With your host, Steve Katarzy. In a world where the new normal is a pretty sad state of affairs, with alarming increases in disease, cancers, cognitive decline, mental issues, obesity, and a general decline in the quality of life and health. Fortunately, there are leaders in the functional medical space that are looking at the whole system, not just the heart or the brain or the liver or the stomach, but everything. The interplay between the entire body and its response to our environment, our lifestyle, food, and mindset. And Dr. Tom O'Brien is one of those leaders. I'm privileged to have him on our podcast today because he is a holistic practitioner who has dedicated his life and work to understanding the sequence of events through time, your body and environment that are causing people a myriad of disease, unease and dysfunction. He's helped literally tens of thousands of people get a better quality of life and is extending his help through books, online presence and talks. Tom has authored two best-selling books on this subject, the first being The Autoimmune Fix, that includes an anti-inflammatory diet reset that I personally have done with my family. And the second most recent book, called You Can Fix Your Brain, extends those concepts by looking specifically on the growing concerning impact that our food, environment and lifestyle has on our brain health. This is a jam-packed episode. We cover so much. Tom is a great speaker, an authority in this space. You will be leaning in and taking notes, I'm sure. And if you like what you hear in this one hour episode, be sure to check out the links in the show notes that will point you towards his books for further reading. Enjoy this episode, guys. Adapt Nation. Dr. Tom O'Brien, thank you so much for joining this podcast today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I am a big fan of your work. I have read both of your books, and they have made quite a fundamental difference to how I manage my nutrition and my well-being as well as my family's. So um, thank you for all the hard work you do to not only touch the patients you can see face to face, but, you know, bring that value to the masses. And I'm glad I found your work. Oh, Steve, thank you. You know, uh, both both of the books and all of our work um, is focused on encouraging a paradigm shift uh, for people. And people don't think they need a paradigm shift. You know, we think that we're doing pretty good with how we're taking care of ourselves. But um, uh, I'm going to give you an example of a paradigm shift, and then I'm going to um, say why it's so important for us in terms of health and healthcare. So, 1984, a microbiologist in Australia writes a paper, publishes a paper, research paper, saying, you know, I think that sometimes stomach ulcers are caused by a bacterial infection. And the entire world thought that this guy's a nutcase, <laughs> that uh, everybody knows that ulcers come from too much acid in your stomach and you have to take antacids to stop destroying your stomach. Everybody knows that. What kind of nonsense is this? Because bacteria can't live in acid of the stomach. So this, this is just utter nonsense. But he persevered and so what he did was he did an endoscopy. That's when you put a tube down your throat into mm -hmm. your stomach. And he took a picture of his healthy pink stomach tissue. And then he drank a beaker of bacteria, a, a bacterial solution called Heliobacter pylori, H. pylori. He drank a beaker of it. He waited a couple of weeks until he was so sick and had terrible stomach pains did another endoscopy and took pictures of his ulcerated stomach. Then he takes the antibiotics to kill bacteria, waits a few weeks until he feels normal again, and takes a third endoscopy, 
with pictures of his healthy pink tissue of his stomach. And then he publishes it. And then everybody knows he's a nutcase. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he demonstrated the, the uh, mechanism by which bacteria may cause ulcers in the stomach. And to the point to where 21 years later, I mean, everybody thought of this guy, Robert Marshall, as, as a nutcase. But 21 years later, he wins the Nobel Prize in medicine. And the Nobel Committee says, and this is a quote, who with tenacity and a prepared mind challenged prevailing dogma. So that's, that's the platform of what a paradigm shift is when you know something has value to come in at the base level of thinking that changes the way you think about ulcers in this case. You, it changes how you think. And now I'm going to give you two studies and why we need a paradigm shift. The first study is from the World Wildlife Fund about two and a half years ago. And they showed that between 1970 and 2011, in 41 years, there has been on average a 58% reduction in population of every species on the planet that has a spine. Insects, birds, fish. That's crazy, isn't it? Mammals. Yes, it is. 58% across the board in 41 years. For the birds, the average was 35%. For mammals living near fresh water, the average is 78%. 78% of the porcupines are gone. 78% of the beavers are gone. They're, they're, they're just gone. Why? Because they're drinking the water coming out of the streams. If you were drinking the water coming out of the streams by your home or out of the river by your home, you would get cancer quicker. You'd be unable to reproduce just like the animals. Second study, a meta-analysis is when you look at many studies on one subject. And this was a meta-analysis of 186 studies and the time between 1974 and 2011, so 37 years, almost the same time period when the animals are being killed off. And they looked at sperm count in healthy men not infertile men, healthy men. And what did they find? There has been, on average, around the world, a 59% reduction in sperm count in healthy men. Now, that doesn't mean anything to anyone until you learn that scientists worry about extinction of a species at 72%. And we're at 59% in 37 years. What do you think is going to happen in the next 20 years? That we, we just are not aware of a global vision of what's happening on our planet and to our health. We're just not aware of it. And we think learning how to take a better form of vitamin C is going to extend our lives or how to, how to eat more fish is going to uh, reduce brain dysfunction. And those are important concepts, but we need a paradigm shift. We have to change the way that we think about taking care of ourselves, our bodies, and our families, especially the children. And that's what these two books are about. One last point. Do you have a copy of my book there with you, You Can Fix Your Brain? I, I've read it, but it's on a, on a digital platform, so I don't have it available in front of me right now. Okay. Well, the subtitle on the cover of the book is just one hour a week mm. to the best memory, productivity, and sleep you've ever had. That's the subtitle. And it's not a cutesy title. I wrote that because as far as I know, that is the only way to be successful in creating a paradigm shift is because the amount of information at our fingertips or at our eyeballs, I guess, you know, lo looking at a computer, um, is just so overwhelming. It's very, very easy to be overwhelmed and not know where to start.
not know which thing is most important, not knowing what to do. So the message in the book is that you allocate one hour a week Every Tuesday night after dinner, every Sunday morning after church, after services, whenever it is, but that you allocate one hour a week every week. I'm going to learn a little more about how to protect my family or how to enhance the quality of my health. I'm going to spend an hour. I'll read a little more of that book or I'm going to listen to another podcast by Steve. Uh, you know, I'm going to, but one hour a week every week. For example, when you learn that you cannot use plastic containers to store food because the phthalates, the family of chemicals that mold plastic, the phthalates in these containers leach into the food. And if you store your leftover dinner in a plastic container in the refrigerator, the next day your leftover dinner has phthalates in it and you eat the phthalates and they affect your brain function. So when you learn that, you say, my gosh, but I've always used plastic containers. What do I do? Well, you, you go to, um, you know, I, I've got a couple of websites in the book. You go look for glass containers and you go online. You look for glass containers. You order, let's see, I'm going to need four square ones and maybe three round ones and different sizes. And you order them. That takes an hour. You're done for the week. But then for the rest of your life, your family will be protected by uh, when they're eating leftovers, which you're going to eat regularly, leftovers, but they're no longer going to have traces of phthalates in them, which accumulate in your body. But it took an hour to do that. And people don't have time to implement everything right away. So you just bit by bit, one foot in front of the other, bit by bit by bit, move forward. And in six months, You've got this down. You've changed your lifestyle. So that's, that's, that's the premise of the book. We need a paradigm shift. Why You have to learn why we need a paradigm shift. And then how do you begin to implement a paradigm shift without being overwhelmed one hour a week? And I, I agree with that. I believe that the stuff that you're writing and many other functional leaders in this space are documenting things around um, electromagnetic fields, around our nutrition, around the microbiome, which is fascinating. And if you take the time to read the material and listen to the science, uh, you can't help but to feel that everyone should know this. The challenge you have, as I find and I'm sure you find, is it's met with extreme skepticism. It's met with, I'm fine. I'm fine now. So why would I have start avoiding foods I've been eating all my life? It's met with so much emotional attachment. And I feel at times, um, folks like you can come across quite sensationalist, quite dramatic, because you're calling out some, you know, relatively devastating long term impacts of the way in which we lead our lives, the nutrition that we have, the way in which we look after our bodies. That must be a constant challenge for you to balance uh, sensationalizing the problem so it, you can achieve that paradigm shifting moment for society versus offering a level of pragmatism and sympathy and compassion to people's current lives and their lack of skepticism. Well, that's a very good point. And um, uh, people are so overwhelmed, they just keep their heads buried in the sand, you know, and I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm just going to live my life and protect myself and my family, and I'm fine. But when you look at the numbers, more people are getting more diseases earlier in life. More children are on the autism spectrum, exponentially more children. When I came out in practice in 1980, it was one child in 10,000 on the autism spectrum. Now it's one out of 33. And the estimates by world-class scientists at MIT say it'll be one child in two within the next 12 to 15 years. I mean, this is unbelievable what's happening. And we can't keep our heads buried in the sand. Uh, uh, I'm here in California where we've just had the most devastating fires ever in the history of forest fires. And these weren't forests. This was just scrub brush. But it killed um, uh, hundreds of people are still missing. Uh, it, uh, hundreds of homes were burned. 
Um, the worst storms in history are happening every year. Uh, we're, we're seeing this whether it's hurricanes or it's typhoons, but they keep happening like that. So we can't keep our heads buried in the sand much longer. Uh, uh, many scientists say we're at a point of no return now that there's no technology available to stop the momentum of what's happening. Uh, with that concept in mind, that's the platform that we are based on here at the doctor.com. There's no science available to implement, to change the dynamic of what's going on. There is no science available. And so what I look at, um, a quote that's attributed to Albert Einstein was that the problems we've created today cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created the problem. We have to up our game. And unfortunately, as adults, our neural pathways are pretty well enmeshed. And we think down particular lines of thinking. It's the children that will come up with the answer. So we need our kids to have the best brains possible to think outside the box that we've created. Uh, because there is no technology to correct the problems that are happening now. So how do you protect your child's brain? I'll give you a couple of pieces of information on that. Because I think that's the only way in the long term that we're going to save the planet. Uh, uh, so the first study they looked at 300, and I think it was 353, but I'm not sure, maybe in the 340s, pregnant women, and they measured their urine in the eighth month of pregnancy. They were looking for the phthalate levels in their urine. Phthalates are the chemicals that mold plastic, and everyone has phthalates in their body now. That's not an exaggeration. Um, every human they check has phthalates in their urine. That means we're, we're, we all have these toxic residue products in us. And th these 340, 350 women, they graphed them in quartiles. So there was the lowest quartile, the next quartile, the third quartile, and then the highest quartile. And then they followed the offspring of these children for seven years. What did they find? The children of the women in the highest quartile of urine levels of phthalates compared to the children of the women of the lowest quartile of phthalates in the urine, so the highest to the lowest, mm -hmm. and, and they followed the kids for seven years, the average for every one of those children in the highest quartile was seven and a half points lower IQ than the children in the lowest quartile that when mom has these phthalates in her body and she gets pregnant, the phthalates impact on the development of the brain. And there are many studies on this now in animals, how if they give pregnant animals phthalates, the offspring, their brains aren't as good, they don't, they don't function as well, they, they don't measure IQ, but in terms of their brain function and responding to stimuli and thinking where's the food and all those consistently. And, and now we have it in humans, seven and a half points lower IQ. And, it, and the second study was published three years ago in the Journal of Schizophrenia. They measured pregnant women's urine for antibodies. No, I'm sorry, it was blood, not urine. Blood for antibodies to wheat. Which pregnant women were sensitive to wheat? And when they found uh, of all the women who had elevated antibodies to wheat, and they likely didn't know that they were sensitive to wheat, but they were, women in the highest 10%, pregnant women in the highest 10% of antibodies to wheat, their children, 35 to 40 years later, had a 70% increased likelihood of developing schizophrenia, 70% compared to the other children whose mothers had lower levels of antibodies to wheat. And if they were in the top 5% of antibodies to wheat, it was 2.5 fold, 
more likely to develop schizophrenia 35 to 40 years later. So we know that wheat sensitivity may affect pregnant women and the brains of their babies. So we have to educate women of childbearing age how to develop a cleaner, healthier internal environment. So when baby is developing, baby's brain is de developing as optimally as possible. I don't know how else we're going to save the planet. You know, uh, so you, you, you talk about a lot of people are skeptical. I think skepticism is really good. I think it's excellent and I would encourage skepticism. Skepticism means I don't believe that on, on what you say, show me the evidence. And then you look at the evidence. Cynicism is I don't believe what you say I don't, and I don't care if you show me anything, I know what I believe and that's it. So skepticism is really healthy. And if you read my books, Here's the studies on all of this. So just look at it and start thinking a little bit differently. You know, you'll find that you create a paradigm shift. Say, well, it's not that big a deal to get rid of the, the plastic containers in my kitchen. All right, I'll order some glass containers. And you start thinking a little more about this because, you know, it, it doesn't hurt me to do that. Yes, I can get rid of plastic wrap in my kitchen to wrap on food. Yes, I'll start using paper instead, um, wax paper instead, or parchment paper, that come with skepticism, read and explore, and then apply some basic principles one hour a week. As, that is as opposed great. to uh, skepticism combined with, you know, deliberate ignorance, you know, not, not wanting to know, right? Because the knowing requires work, requires to yeah, exactly. change, change our, our current value system, our current um, behaviors, patterns, perhaps it's going to cost more money, perhaps it's going to undergo, you know, cravings and withdrawals and all those kind of things. And I, I think that that for us is is the challenge, right there. I, I want us to get into the bit of the detail as to why these things are causing the problems you see. But may I, may I just make, yeah. um, just a clarification, it's not skepticism, it's cynicism, that will not look with open eyes. Skepticism says, I don't believe it, show me the show evidence. Me. Yeah. And, then, and then you look. Cynicism is, I don't believe it, I don't want to see any evidence. So yeah. it's, the, it, it's the cynic that is the one that's locked into a way of thinking and, and refuses to change. A skeptic is open. Show me the evidence and I'll review it. So I welcome skepticism here. So let's, um, let's start at the... The, the beginning of helping people understand at a kind of system level why these toxins or, um, yeah, these toxins, whether it be from environment or through food, are causing some of the problems we have. So could you just at a high level explain, you know, the cascade or spectrum uh, of exposure to antigens and, and how that they can lead up to autoimmune diseases and symptoms. So how does this manifest from whether it be having wheat or dairy or be how you know being exposed to a pollutant or heavy metal? What's happening within the body for these things to be a problem as we see them today? Yeah, that's a very good question. Do you have three weeks to talk? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but let's let's give it a shot. Mrs. Patient. Our bodies are exactly the same as our ancestors. We have the same bones, muscles, ligaments, joints, genes. You know, genes don't change very quickly. Uh, it takes thousands of years for genes to change. Uh, although in this last century, uh, because of all the chemicals we're exposed to, genes can be manipulated quite easily. But our ancestors, Mrs. Patient, your immune system is the armed forces in your body. It's there to protect you. There's an army, a navy, an air corps, an air force, marines, coast guard, different branches of the immune system, all there to protect you. So when your immune system gets activated, the question is, what's it trying to protect you from? So our ancestors 
the immune systems were designed, and our immune system is just like our ancestors thousands of years ago. The immune system was designed to protect us from viruses, parasites, bugs, mold, and fungus. That's it. There was nothing else in the environment for our ancestors that they had to be protected from. It was viruses, molds, parasites, bugs, and fungus. That was it. Your immune system, Mrs. Patient, is designed to protect you from viruses, molds, bugs, parasites, and fungus. That's it. We, don't, we haven't adapt in such a way that we have a specific response completely focused on dealing with bisphenol A, BPA, the most common phthalate that people have heard about in plastic and water bottles and things, or from mercury that's in fish. We don't have an immune system designed to handle heavy metals like mercury and lead, because there was no lead poisoning for our ancestors. There was no mercury poisoning. There was minute traces in the soil but that nowhere near the concentrations that we're exposed to now all the time. There was no such thing. You don't see, our ancestors never saw coming out of the mountains streams of Coca-Cola. There's no such thing. So when you drink Coca-Cola, your immune system gets activated as if it's fighting a virus, parasite, bug, mold, or fungus. That's it. That's all it can do. And so we have, and the technical way of saying it is that we have a limited number of options for an unlimited number of insults. Mm -hmm. Every is this child, the toxic threshold you're talking about in terms of yep. how yes. much toxicity your body can handle? That's where we're going. Okay. Every, every child that's checked at birth in the, the placental blood, every child has at least 180 toxic chemicals in their bloodstream that are not supposed to be there. 180, that's every child. And many of them are neurotoxins. They affect the development of the brain. 180 toxic chemicals there are not supposed to be there that, that, that poor baby's immune system has no defense against. The Journal of Pediatrics published a paper a couple of years ago it was a position paper, which means this is our position. This is a very important concept. This is a position paper on environmental toxicity. They identified that it's 250 pounds. That would be how many kilograms in 250 pounds? Let's see. That about would be half. about about 110, 115 kilograms of toxic chemicals per person per day that are being dumped in the United States. I don't know what the number is in Europe, but I'm sure it's not far um, away from there. 250 pounds per person per day, every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, year after year after year, 250 pounds of these toxic chemicals. We're breathing them, we're drinking them, the chemicals, we're eating them, and our bodies have no defense against these types of chemicals. And all of them get treated like a virus, mold, bug, parasite, or fungus, every single one of them. So that's the big picture overview. And when your body is continually fighting what it thinks is a parasite, you can then develop, and there's a whole mechanism as to why, it's outlined in the first book, The Autoimmune Fix, but you can develop an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or vitiligo, which is a loss of skin color or alopecia, losing your hair. And it's so very common that these autoimmune diseases develop as a response of the immune system trying to protect you from all of the toxic chemicals and foods that we're being exposed to. And you, talk, you talk about in your book, a, a spectrum, uh, Dr. Tom, of being, being on the kind of onset or early stage, perhaps, of a variety of autoimmune conditions, but not expressing any symptoms today. Say if you're a, a mid-20-year-old male 
uh, and you you drink out of plastic bottles, you have loads of wheat, you have loads of sugar in your diet, as we most most of us do. You you eat uh, oblivious to any of the risks, and you don't express, or you, at least you don't you're not aware of expressing any symptoms. You talk about a spectrum that kind of catches up on on you uh, without over sensationalizing that. Could you explain what you mean by that kind of spectrum of autoimmunity? Yes, you bet. It's a, it's a critically important concept. Um, uh, cardiovascular disease, when you read the science, and every cardiologist knows this, that they don't talk about it, but they know that. Um, cardiovascular disease, the number one killer in our world today, is an autoimmune mechanism that the, the plugging up of your pipes occurs because of an immune response creating inflammation, fighting something, and it's the bacteria and the toxic chemicals that are in the blood vessels and get stuck in the lining of the blood vessels. So the number one cause of death begins as an autoimmune mechanism. But nobody dies of a heart attack when they first start getting inflammation. Mm. Uh, that it takes years and decades of this mechanism going on. And it's true for multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis that you don't get, or Alzheimer's, you don't get Alzheimer's when you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's. You get Alzheimer's years and years beforehand when these elevated antibodies, your immune system trying to protect you, is killing off brain cells. Now we've got, uh, I don't know the number, I believe it's in the trillions of brain cells. Um, uh, and if you lose 150 brain cells a day because your immune system's trying to protect you from uh, some toxic chemicals that have gotten into the blood and leached into the brain, and your immune system is trying to protect you and attacking these toxic chemicals or these heavy metals in the brain like aluminum. And then the collateral damage from that attack, that inflammation, kills your own brain cells. If you lose 1,000 or 2,000 brain cells a day, you don't feel any different. You can't tell. And the next day, 1,000, 2,000 brain cells, you don't feel any different. And the next week after... Uh, weeks and months of this, 1,000, 2,000 brain cells, you feel no difference. You feel no difference until somewhere down the road, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, now you've lost hundreds of thousands, maybe a few million brain cells. Now you notice that you walk into a room and you can't remember why you walked in the room. What was I going to do? Mm -hmm. Or you don't remember where you put your keys. You start seeing these little signs but the lifestyle is continuing that's causing the exposure to these toxic compounds that get into your body, whether it's a food you're sensitive to, whatever it is, and you're killing off more brain cells and more brain cells and more brain cells, and there's an accumulative effect because this stuff just sits around in there. So you get more inflammation and more inflammation, killing off more brain cells, more brain cells. So your loss of memory is expedited. So it may have taken you 30 years to get to, oh, I forgot where I put my keys. Now it takes you two years to, well, I'm driving down the road. Oh, I forgot to make the turn to go back home. That there's an, there, there's an acceleration of the deterioration until one day your symptoms are so distressing, you go see a doctor. And the doctor runs a few tests and he says, it looks like we've got something going on here. So it starts with hundreds of brain cells, a few thousand brain cells being killed off and you feel nothing. And you ha continue having the exposure because you don't know that wheat, for example, may be a problem for you or dairy may be a problem for you. You don't know that's the case. So you keep eating wheat or keep eating dairy keep killing off more brain cells if that's the where the tissue where it manifests or your kidney cells or your liver cells or your skin cells it just it doesn't matter wherever your genetic vulnerability is is where the deterioration will occur 
And the result is you kill off more cells, kill off more cells, kill off more cells, kill off more cells until one day you start getting some symptoms. Then you go to the doctor. And the average with autoimmune diseases is that they've seen on average five different practitioners and it's taken 11 years since they first went to a doctor with symptoms before they get the right diagnosis because there's nothing that's obvious until you've killed off so many cells, now it becomes obvious. Mm. So when do you think you get Parkinson's? It's not when you start shaking and you go to the doctor and they give you a diagnosis of Parkinson's. We now know Parkinson's starts in the gut with the microbiome 25 years before you ever start shaking. The mechanism begins decades earlier. And that's true with all autoimmune conditions. They start decades, years and years and years beforehand. So now the blood tests are available to look and see, is my immune system attacking my own tissue? Whether it's your brain or your heart or your lungs or your liver, your bones or your joints, or your kidneys, your reproductive system, you can do screening tests now that's called predictive autoimmunity. Because if you have elevated antibodies, when is it normal to have antibodies to your own tissue? Well, I'll give you the example of your thyroid. If you do a blood test for thyroid, looking for antibodies to thyroid, there's a normal reference range of antibodies to thyroid. Mm -hmm. Most labs, it's 0 to 40, 0 to 42 for most laboratories. It just depends on the lab as to what the normal reference range is. And so why would we have any antibodies attacking our own tissue? Mrs. Patient, you have an entire new body every seven years. Every cell in your body regenerates, every cell. Some cells are very quick, like the inside lining of your guts every three to five days. Some cells are very slow, like bone cells, brain cells. But every cell regenerates. So how does that happen? Your body makes antibodies to your thyroid in this example to get rid of the old and damaged cells to make room for new cells. So there's a normal reference range for thyroid, zero to 42 in most labs. That's normal. But when you have elevated antibodies on a lab test, you're killing off more cells than you're making. And so now you're developing a deficit. And when that continues, elevated antibodies for days and weeks and months and years, killing off more cells, killing off more cells, killing off more cells, eventually, at some point, your thyroid or any other tissue, your thyroid can't function properly anymore. You've killed off too many cells. Now you start getting subtle symptoms of thyroid problems cold hands and feet, you wear socks to bed, hard to get out of bed in the morning, you keep hitting the snooze, can't lose that last five pounds even if you don't eat for two or three days, some minor depression, some sluggishness, energy's low, all signs of thyroid. You go to the doctor and they say, oh, you're fine, it's just stress. And then you go back to the doctor six months, a year later, because it's getting worse, and they say, well, let's check your thyroid. And then they see you have a thyroid problem, so they give you hormone, thyroid hormone. And it never works completely. It helps a little bit, but it can't work completely. And the result is you keep living the lifestyle that's killing off more thyroid cells, killing off more thyroid cells, killing off more thyroid cells. Then you eventually develop the autoimmune disease of the thyroid called Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. Those are the two autoimmune diseases of the thyroid. And then you tell your family, oh, I, I, I just got Hashimoto's. No, you didn't. <laughs> You got Hashimoto's years ago. That lifestyle has set you up for this. And then, the, but the doctors don't think this way. They just give you a drug to deal with some of the symptoms, but the mechanism continues. Whether it's, whether it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or rheumatoid or Hashimoto's, the mechanism continues. Let me give you one more visual and then I'll pause. Of course. When you know, a patient comes in and they say, you know, I'm forgetting things, or they say, you know, I'm cold, I'm sluggish, I don't have enough energy. It's like you've fallen over a waterfall 
and you've crashed into the pond below. You swim up to the surface. <laughs> God, thank God I'm alive. You spit the water out, you know, and you're trying to stay afloat in this pond of thyroid dysfunction or this pond of diabetes or this pond of loss of memory. Doesn't matter. Or a pond of recurrent miscarriages. Doesn't matter what the pond is. You're in a pond. The, and you're trying to stay afloat. But the water is so turbulent because the waterfall keeps falling into the pond. It's hard to stay afloat. You're still living the lifestyle that's causing the symptoms. It's hard to stay afloat. It's hard to function with these symptoms. So everybody wants a life jacket to stay afloat in the pond of diabetes or whatever the condition is. And so you try for the um, life jacket, the, the treatment approach with the least side effects possible. But if it, they don't work, you take the drugs. Don't be silly. Don't drown in the pond of diabetes or of Hashimoto's thyroid or any other disease. You take the medication if you need to, but you don't stay in the pond. You swim over to the side of the pond, get out of the water, walk up the hill, walk back up the river and figure out what fell in the river that carried me downstream. Eventually I fell into the pond of diabetes or into the pond of Hashimoto's. So what am I talking about? What is it in your lifestyle? What is it in your home? Do you have mold in the house that you're breathing every day? Do you have a wheat sensitivity or a dairy sensitivity? Do you have lots of phthalates in your body affecting your function? You have to go back upstream, that's the technical term, is go upstream to figure out what the heck happened to me. And then you deal with that. And that's how you get out of the pond of whatever your symptoms are. So my wife, um, you, you explained the uh, situation my wife is going through right now. So we're both in our mid-30s. And up until we were 30, we were either unaware or didn't express any meaningful symptoms at all, really. We're both healthy and vibrant and, you know, just going about life as we did. We clicked into our early 30s and we started to either become aware or be, you know, visibly start to see changes. With my wife, um, she has been diagnosed with Hashimoto's and she has all of the symptoms you described and much of which were ignored or just exacerbated to the point we decided to investigate but yes. the, the 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 situation for her is is one where she is taking a medication but she has decided to take a complete 180 lifestyle change around anything and everything that is a potential causal effect to creating that inflammation but what's interesting around her results is from a, a thyroid perspective the thyroid hormone is actually at relatively normal levels but it's the elevated antibodies that we're concerned about and the symptoms that come along with it. When you have acknowledged that you have elevated antibodies beyond the reference range, so your, your body is attacking and killing off more cells than, than is normal for normal cell turnover, how should you think about responding to that? Is it, is it something that if you're at the low end of a low end of the problem that you should change a few things and hope for the best or does it require at that point typically fairly dramatic change and review of how you've lived your life so far really good question when you have elevated antibodies your immune system is trying to tell you something the armed forces have been called out and it's up to you do you keep a blind eye and say, oh, it's not that big a deal. We don't have to worry about it. Or do you say, oh, all right, well, I still feel pretty good, but all right, I'll figure out what this is so I can calm down my immune system. Because, you know, you're either going to, I mean, there was a wonderful commercial on television when I was growing up uh, that has always stayed with me. And um, it was a cowboy, a uh, uh, from the old cowboy movies, and he was hired to do this commercial, and he's talking about an oil filter for your car. And he stands there, it's a close-up, and he's holding the oil filter. It was called a Fram oil filter. And he says, Fram, holding the oil filter, and he points to it. And it was $5.95, $5.95. 
And he points to it and he says, you can pay me now. And in the background, there was a tow truck hauling away a car whose engine was smoking. Lots of smoke coming out of the engine. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. <laughs> you know, so that's the way it is, folks. When you've got elevated antibodies, your body is trying to tell you you got a problem and it's not going to go away. So it's up to you. That's why, you know, the blood tests now, you can do blood tests that look at many different tissues in your brain to see if you have elevated antibodies to your brain. If you do, you're killing off more brain cells than you're making right now. It's not, well, I feel fine. I mean, if you think like that, all right, just wait, a few more million cells get killed off, and then you'll realize you forgot to turn to uh, down your street that you've turned down for the last 15 years every day when you go home. You missed it. And you'll, oh, wait, I, I missed it. I just wasn't thinking. And you'll start seeing more and more of that as you kill off more brain cells and kill off more brain cells and kill off more brain cells. So it's really up to you. When do you want to address this? Do you think it's going to go away? So do you want to be like a uh, ostrich and bury your head in the sand and hopefully nothing's going to happen? Or are you going to take preventive action as your wife is doing now and start addressing your foods and your environment and the toxins in your environment and notice that you start functioning better right away and that uh, over time those antibodies should come down. Uh, we check our patients every six months when they've got elevated antibodies. They better be coming down or we miss something. Uh, uh, we, we didn't do our job right if the antibodies are not coming down within six months. So Tom, you talk about something called memory memory B cells. If if I'm saying this right, this is effectively you have uh, your auto so your immune system has remembered how to fight said toxin. So if it ever re enters the body, it can reinitiate the armed forces quicker. Um, and if I understand that correctly, that that stays with your body forever. So if you for example, had too much exposure to both wheat and sugar and plastic and some environmental pollutants that created a toxic threshold where it sent you over the edge you fell down the waterfall you started expressing your con your condition whether it be early onset of alzheimer's or in my wife's in instance hashimoto's or i have a little bit of vitiligo you go, okay, I'm going to start changing a few things. Maybe I'm going to cut the wheat out for a few, a few weeks. Maybe I feel a little bit better. Your antibodies start to reduce, hopefully, as you as you say. Then then what? Because if you've got this memory to um, always, you know, setting off the armed forces every time you have said toxin, is that something people have to basically live with and accept? I, if I go off wheat and I feel better, I can never have wheat again. Because for a lot of people especially when it comes to nutrition, that's a, that's a very um, emotionally charged subject. That's a really good question. Uh, uh, and you said, if I go off wheat and I feel better, uh, I can never have wheat again. Um, that's not accurate. Uh, I'm hoping not. I'm hoping you can clarify. <laughs> but what's, what's accurate is if I have elevated antibodies to wheat, I, I can never have it again. That is true. But if you feel better going off wheat, it doesn't mean necessarily that your immune system has been activated to protect you from it. You have to check the immune system to confirm if you have elevated antibodies. And most of the tests are notoriously inaccurate. There are a couple laboratories that have very good tests. One of those laboratories is now in Great Britain. Uh, that's called Cyrex, C-Y-R-E-X, mm -hmm. and it's, dis it's distributed through uh, uh, Regenerous Labs uh, in the UK. It's a very good test, and it's much more comprehensive than the tests that the national laboratories use. Um, but that test is from the 1990s. Um, it's good, but it's not comprehensive, and you need more comprehensive tests. So if the test comes back, and says, you've got elevated antibodies, you've got a problem for life. That's not gonna go away. The elevated anti antibodies to that wheat, for example, but that's not always yeah. the case. You could have elevated antibodies to something else or a specific right. tissue. Right, with with one correction from what you said, there, as far as I know, there's no antibodies to sugar. 
uh, 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 antibodies are made to different proteins. And so there's no antibodies to sugar. Okay. Uh, but for wheat, dairy, uh, different foods, um, absolutely. Um, it, and you're right, it's called a memory B cell. Um, and I'll give you that analogy. Uh, this may be our, our last point today. Mrs. Patient, when you get a vaccination for measles, they give you a shot of the bug measles. And your brain says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. And it says, you, general. The brain says, general. And in your immune system, you have Army, Air Force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do. General, you now are general measles. Take care of this. General measles builds an assembly line. The assembly line starts producing soldiers. Those soldiers are called antibodies. They're special forces. And they go out into the bloodstream and they're looking for measles. Nothing else, just measles. And when they see measles, they fire their high-powered rifles to kill the measles bug. When all of the measles bug from the vaccination is gone, General Measles, who's watching this, says, okay, turn off the assembly line. We don't need you guys out here right now. If you were to do a blood test right now for measles, you should not have any antibodies in your bloodstream to measles, unless you've been recently exposed. But General Measles is now vigilant the rest of his life. The rest of his life. If measles ever comes back into the bloodstream again, some guy in a plane just came back from Africa and he coughs and you breathe in, gets into your lungs, into your bloodstream. General measles is vigilant to look for these bugs. If measles ever comes back, he just has to flip the switch to turn on the assembly line. He doesn't have to build the assembly line. When you first get a vaccination, it takes months before you've got immunity to measles. And, you know, it starts right away, but it takes months before the whole system is built up. That's why if you go to Africa, you need vaccinations for yellow fever and dengue fever and these weird diseases months ahead of time. But if you go back 20 years later, you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go. Everybody's heard of booster shots. And that's because you just have to wake up general yellow fever or general dengue fever. He's already there. He's just sleeping, you know, just at an arresting state. And then when you do the booster shot, he just has to turn the switch on. And the assembly line is producing the antibodies in one day. And you're protected when you go to visit Africa. When you make elevated antibodies to wheat, you have memory B cells developed to wheat. They are with you the rest of your life. So you find out that you have a wheat sensitivity, you've got elevated antibodies on a blood test, you get off wheat completely, completely. You check again three to six months later, the antibodies are gone. And you say to the doc, well, can I have some wheat now? And the doc, if he's studied and if he knows his stuff, will say, no, no, you've got memory B cells. But, you know, in our case, in my office, what we know with patients, they don't like to hear that. They, they I like my pizza, you know, or whatever it should be. So Mrs. Patient, and I explain all about memory B cells, and I say, but so here's what you can do. If you want, go ahead and eat some wheat. You know, go have, have wheat for a couple of weeks. Uh, I don't recommend it, but if you're going to do this, go ahead. And then we'll do another blood test. And if general wheat gets turned on again, now you know. And every person who's done that has come back on the follow-up blood test with elevated antibodies to wheat again because that's our physiology. It, they're there to protect us. They don't go away. And the problem is with your generation, excuse me, but your generation, the millennials want it now, right now. I want it and I want it now. I want my wheat and I want it now. I can have what I, whatever I want. You know, these crazy commercials that I see um, in the movie theaters, when I, when I go to a movie now, there's this whole theme because I can. So Coca-Cola is doing this marketing now on the big screen where some cute young woman, you know, will come on screen. She's very happy and buoyant and 
walking through different scenes. And in the background, there's some Adonis looking guys playing volleyball, flexing their muscles, you know, and other beautiful women around all jumping and happy and, and all that. And she says, you know, you can eat organic and live in a yurt if you want to. And she says it in a demeaning kind of way. But me, I'm going to have fun and I'm going to eat what I want and I'm going to drink what I want because I can. And they're, they're marketing to the millennials for their independence and tying in their desire for independence to think outside the box. And the result is these Coca-Cola commercials are, are capturing the millennials, that they want it now. And this is something where you just have to read the science and understand there are some things about the body that do not accommodate today's lifestyle. Well said. Well said, Dr. Tom. Um, I know that we are running short of time. I'm going to ask you one brief last question, if uh, you don't mind, just to close on something which I think can help clarify the uniqueness and difference in everyone. Some people, some people are, um, un, you know, eating all the things that we suggest they shouldn't, and they're fine. Others have a sniff of a peanut and, you know, they have a major allergic reaction. Some people are seem to be predisposed to certain life conditions, others aren't. So there's this uniqueness in humanity. You talk about something called your weak link. This, uh, this idea that we are all, if we live in the same lifestyle, we're all exposed to the same conditions. But it's the, the, the weakness in your DNA or your genetics that will... Um, expose the condition. That's where the inflammation will go. That's where the attack will go. That's where the symptoms will be expressed. I if you could close on that as a concept, I think that will help people understand that whilst their next door neighbor's eating, you know, worse than them, but has no symptoms, and uh, they're trying to clean their diet, and they're feeling worse. Like, why, why is it? Why is this level of unfairness? How, if you could explain it, that'd be fantastic. Of course, of course. Excellent question. Mrs. Patient, if you pull at a chain, it always breaks at the weakest link. It may be at one end, in the middle, at the other end, wherever the weak link is, that's where the chain's gonna break. So the goal in life, don't pull on the chain so hard. You know, that's the goal. But that weak link is determined by your genetics. Having a particular gene for example, for Alzheimer's, the APOE4 gene is the one commonly known to be associated with developing Alzheimer's. If you have an APOE4, it does not mean you're gonna get Alzheimer's. It means that you are vulnerable to getting Alzheimer's. That's the weak link in your chain. It's no different than someone else that has a weak link in their chain for kidney disease. It's no different than someone that has a weak link in their chain for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. It's no different. It's the pull on the chain that you have to worry about. Stop pulling on the chain so hard. And the, ba uh, the basic concept is live an anti-inflammatory lifestyle it, because it's inflammation that pulls on the chain, whether it manifests as Alzheimer's eventually or as vitiligo or as Hashimoto's, or as rheumatoid arthritis, it doesn't matter what pond you fall into. I'm, I, I don't mean to be uh, impersonal, but it doesn't matter. That's just your genetic vulnerability. What matters is you're pulling on the chain. So you have to go back upstream and figure out what fell in the river that started pulling on the chain, carrying you downstream, making the link weaker and weaker and weaker until you fell over the waterfall and that weak link burst. Now you get a diagnosis of Hashimoto's. Uh, it's such that, a refreshing um, way of looking at things, this idea of anti-inflammatory lifestyle. Because we as humans, I think we like to see things black and white. Give me the rules. If I have right. gluten, I'm going to get this. If I have... Uh, if I have too much dairy, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this condition. If I live my life this way, this is gonna happen to me. And what you're saying is, you, there isn't this cause and effect, direct cause and effect between this one toxin or overuse of said compound and you having these symptoms. Instead, it's the 
when you've got too much toxicity and too much inflammation, where it shows up in your body is going to be unique to you based on your genetics and your DNA. That is uh, very interesting. And I think if people can understand that, they can start being their own inspectors, their crime scene investigators, working out what in their body is their, you know, their genetic weakness, and then ensuring that from a, from a diet and lifestyle perspective, they're looking after themselves and not creating excess inflammation. That is exactly right. And that, um, in the world of functional medicine, that is a basic 101 concept, meaning it's an introductory level concept. And all of our doctors have been trained with the one symptom, one drug approach mm -hmm. to life. You have this symptom, you take this drug. You have this symptom, you take that drug. And that has helped save a lot of lives, of course, and it will not encourage greater levels of health and stop the increasing numbers of people that are getting more degenerative diseases. You cannot approach your health from the one symptom, one drug approach. You can't do it, it won't work. The science is very clear. You gotta go back upstream and stop pulling on the chain so hard. Thank you, Tom. I think that's a great place to end this discussion. Where can people find your work and you generally on the internet? Oh, thank you. Uh, our website is thedr.com, thedoctor.com. Just don't spell the word doctor out, thedr.com. And our books are there. Uh, you, you can click on the books. It'll take you to a number of different spots like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Books A Million. But if you go through our website, you also then can download a number of articles. Uh, uh, we've got hundreds of different articles that are all free on the site to begin this one hour a week education, people. Remember, once again, just one hour a week to the best memory, productivity, and sleep you've ever had. And in six months, you look back and you say, I'm so glad that we developed this approach. And for example, Steve, for you and your wife, maybe you guys do it together one hour a week. And in six months, you've changed so many little things that are starting to give benefit to you, the quality of your lives. That's exactly what we've been doing for this year. Uh, we've, we've literally been taking small incremental shifts towards improving our nutrition selecting better quality food, not just the types of food, but the quality of food, you know, making sure we're exercising, making sure we're getting enough rest, you know, working on our, our bone structure through going to the chiropractors, getting massage. We're not spending exuberantly, uh, exuberantly and we're not doing it all in one go, but we've had this kind of commitment towards longevity and living in the moment. So I hope people find your work, Tom. Um, I would highly recommend both books. Uh, the first book is, uh, you know, it did, does go into the detail, perhaps more than the second, really helps expose you to un the understanding of antibodies, inflammation, autoimmunity, and what to do about it from an anti-inflammatory perspective. And then a second, I'd say is perhaps a little bit more pragmatic. It's a little bit uh, more compassionate. Um, it is more specific to the brain health. And um, I think it's a welcome discussion for anyone who starts thinking, hey, m maybe I'm, I'm getting a little bit more forgetful. Maybe I've got conditions in a family of Alzheimer's and I want to get ahead of that. Both great books. I highly recommend them, Tom. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you. Have a great week. Take care, Tom. And guys, that just leaves me to say that Adapt Nation is all about providing you the tools and expert knowledge to help you improve and optimize your strength, health, and mindset inside and out. If you enjoy this show, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps. And of course, recommend us to any friends or family who you think might also enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. This is Adapt Nation.